O oh Lord, on this day when we remember outspoken voices who championed human dignity, the full worth of the human spirit, and peacefully demanded justice for the oppressed, we follow in the footsteps of all those who went before us. In service to our fellow human beings, we reach far into our communities, refusing to turn back to old ways, marching ahead in peace and acceptance, celebrating the truth of God's love for all, and standing by the knowledge that all people are created equal. Faith lived out requires our presence and strength to speak out against injustice and to turn our backs against what harms our fellow man. Jesus showed us a more excellent way to love, that we should reach across the aisle and hold the hand of those who are not the same, just as Jesus did. We will wrap our arms around our community. Our voices will no longer be weak or unsure. We won't turn a blind eye to broken promises, but instead ride on God's mighty truth, the full length and breadth that is required of us. We will defend as He defends, support as He supports, do as He did, love as He commands. Amen. Good morning, brethren. You know, it is very sad when the Church, the body of Christ, which is supposed to be united and active in His service, is instead plagued by division, dissensions, fighting, and it ends up stagnating in slumber and inactivity, instead of being eagerly active to serve the Lord. To prevent that, the Lord has given us important instructions in the New Testament and in particular in the epistles. And we're looking at some of them right now. We are going through a brief series, series on 1 Corinthians. In the first message, we looked at our motives in desiring the Holy Spirit. In the second message last week, we looked at how the spiritual gifts that we receive from the Holy Spirit should not be abused or misused for personal benefit, but used for the glory of God and the service of the Church. Today we continue with that theme and we look at how the unity of the body of Christ should be understood and lived in the Church. It's important that we understand that. We read Paul's instructions that God inspired to the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and this time we're going to read from verse 12 to verse 31. Let's read it together. For even as a body is one, and yet as many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of a body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of a body. And if the ear says, because I'm not an eye, I'm not a part of a body, it is not for this reason any the less a part of a body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as He desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which deem, we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable. 
whereas our more presentable members have no need of that. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffers with, suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles and second prophets and third teachers, then miracles and gifts of healings and helps and ministrations and various kinds of tongues. Are they not? All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All are, do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? And all do not interpret, do they? But they earnestly desire the greater gifts. And I show you a still more excellent way. Well, brethren, the image that Paul has used in this passage in general was actually an image that was commonly used by the Romans. But he obviously may use it, but applies it to the church in a in a slightly different, uh, not actually in a different meaning. In early Rome, the lower class in Rome wanted to revolt. They felt it was unfair for them to be treated as lesser people and secondary citizens. But there was one leader, Menenius Agrippa, who prevented that revolt by convincing the Romans that even the less noticeable people were needed and equally important. Of course, his intent was to keep the lower class subdued. But that argument that even the lesser people or the less important or the less noticeable people are needed and equally important kind of remained in, in the language or in the illustrations and imagery of the Romans. And it is not a surprise that it may have reached Palestine as well. But in Paul's use, that is applied to the unity of the body. Not to keep one group down below the others, but so that we will learn to respect and appreciate one another as we go about the service of the Lord. Let's read verse 12. For even as the body is one, and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though there are many, are one body, so also is Christ. It is clear here that Paul is saying that <clears throat> he's using the image of a human body that is comprised of, of many members. But he's making a point of about the di diversity of the many parts. The, the, the parts that comprise the body, the members of the body, are not all one and the same. They are different. But they are functioning together as one. And so by pointing that out, Paul draws from that image, draw for that draws from that illustration to emphasize the unity of the body. And, and that is similar to our being in Christ. Our being in Christ is pretty much the same as Paul says in there. So also is Christ. We're all different. There is diversity in the members of the body of Christ, but we are called to function together just like the human body to be blessed in that unity of the church, unity of the body of Christ. Verse 13, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Now, brethren, what gives us unity is not our, I don't know, ethnic background, our status in the world, our wealth, or any of the 
worldly or physical things at all. Unity is given to us, as we see here clearly, by one Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that is giving us unity is the same Spirit that gives us the diversity of gifts. And that Spirit immerses us into the one body, which is the body of Jesus Christ. The body of Christ, the Church. And that's that's an incredible blessing, but we'll, we'll deal with that a bit later. Verses 14 to 16. For the body is not one member, but many. If a foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body, it is not for this reason any less a part of a body. And if the ear says, because I am not an eye, I am not a part of a body, it is not for this reason any less a part of the body. Now, brethren, Every part of a human body is necessary for the proper functioning of the body, of the whole body. And so it is for the church, the body of Christ. No one should regard themselves or their gift as being inferior. And here it's made, it's made clear, brethren, that the Holy Spirit does not distribute the gifts at random, by chance, but distributes them carefully, intentionally, according to his perfect will and according to his infinite wisdom. The Holy Spirit is very intentional in that. But notice the main point in here. The Corinthians expected to receive a spectacular gift. And most likely all of them thought they would receive the same gift. Some people think that they wanted to receive the gift of tongues as a, as a sign gift. And if they didn't receive that particular gift, they thought they were not part of the church or the body. And I see a similar reasoning even today in some of the churches, unfortunately. But that statement that Paul makes in here, like for example, if a foot says, because I am not a hand, so here's an individual who receives a gift that looks at and another gift and it says, because I don't have that gift, I am not part of a body. That statement that Paul makes, it is not for this reason any less a part of a body. Debunks that reasoning. That statement corrects that wrong view. Because it says that even if we think so, we don't stop being part of the body. We're just a part of a body that doesn't function the way it should. No one should say that because they did not receive a specific gift, they are not part of the church. And that's important. Verses 17 and 18. Paul here is addressing the issue directly. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? And if the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in a body just as he desired. It's very, very clear, isn't it? He addresses the issue quite directly in this statement here. If everyone has the same gift, then who would supply the other necessary gifts? The church does not work on one gift alone. The church works and works well from the sum total of what every part, every member, can contribute to the benefit of the body. The other gifts are necessary. And then just like we cannot function without a part of the body, so the church cannot function properly without the variety that the Holy Spirit gives. We need all the gifts that He chooses to give us, not just one, or some of them. Verses 19 to 21. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, or again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So similar to the previous statement, there would be no body if it was just a hand or a nose, 
there would be no body. And similarly in the church, there would be no body that the church if everyone was just one member. If everyone is an eye, where is the body? All there is is an eye, but an eye cannot function by itself. The eye cannot see by itself. The eye only collects the light, transforms the light into electrical sense, uh, um, impulses and send to the brain. The brain decodes those, those signals and forms a picture that we see. But the eye in and by itself does not function. In fact, it cannot even sur survive. And that's the same for every member of our body. But it's the same also for the church. We need each member. We need each gift in the church to function adequately and properly the way that God intended it to be. We need you and what the Holy Spirit has given you to contribute. It is precious. And Paul here tells us that one, you should not minimize that, the importance of that. You should not look down on that, nor should anyone else. No one else in the body of Christ has the right to look down on your gift because it's just as precious as any other gift. And it's important that that gift be exercised in the body of Christ. So that also means that none of us has the right to despise or minimize anybody else's gift. But we should honor them and give them the opportunity to be expressed. There is one mandate that God has given me as a pastor. And one mandate is, it's not for me to do everything. Of course, as a member of the body of Christ, I participate in that, in the work of the body as well. But the role as a pastor is for the equipping of the saints for every good work. The role that God has given me is to encourage others to express what God has given them to express. To use the gift that God has given them and to create an opportunity for them to do so. The concept that Paul and God through Paul presents in here is a concept of interdependence. An interdependence that is created through a diversity of gifts. Where I find myself weak, the strength of my wife compensates for that. But that is only because we have different gifts. And God has given us different roles. If God had given us the same gift and the same role, my weakness would be her weakness as well. And so our weakness collectively would be even stronger, even worse. But by the grace of God, that diversity of gifts creates that situation where we can be interdependent so that where I am strong, I can compensate for her weakness and where he's strong, she can, con con uh, she can compensate for my weakness. And so we work with one another, we help one another, and together, even as the book of Ecclesiastes reminds us, I, I mean, yeah, the Ecclesiastes and the book of Proverbs reminds us, we become so much stronger. Verses 22 and 23. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are unnecessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable. In here, Paul is just using an imagery of the fact that there are some parts of the body which are less presentable, on which we place more attention, more attention to, to cover them, more attention to adorn them or, or make them more presentable. The, the point, however, that he's made is that we are not like the world. The world despises the weak. But we are called to care for the weak and give them special consideration. God has appointed that we should care for one another's weaknesses with the strengths that he has given us, as we just mentioned a moment ago. 
So if the members of the body, if the members of the church are for some reason weaker, we're called to compensate for that. We're called to provide the strength that is needed. We're called to step in in that interdependence and care for them and help them. So, verses 24 and 25. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. But well, that makes it pretty clear. But God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that they may be, there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. Notice how it is intentional. What I mean with intentional, notice that what it says. God has so composed the body. God has composed the body of Christ, the church, in this way, the way it is, intentionally. And for the purpose of teaching us to be like Him. To teach us to serve one another. If He gave every single one all, this, all the, the strengths and none of the weaknesses, we would not need one another at all. And we would only learn to be proud and perhaps kind of independent of each other and who knows what else. Maybe contending with one another who's better. But God has given us a structure that is different. The strengths of one are not the strengths of the other and vice versa. And so we are called to use our strength to serve one another, to express His love to one another. In other words, to be willing to give of ourselves, in this case our strength, or the strength that God has given us, to help the other who may not have the same strength. And in some cases, He's called us to sacrifice ourselves for each other. Brethren, I know that serving one another is inconvenient. I know that very well. But it doesn't matter. Our calling is too important, too great, too majestic to be so cheap as to think, well, it's inconvenient, I don't care about it. Sometimes we're called to sacrifice ourselves, but didn't Jesus sacrifice himself for us? And is it wrong for him to ask us to sacrifice a, a minute fraction of that for him? So we're called to express God's love that he pours in our hearts by the Holy Spirit to one another and sometimes to sacrifice ourselves to serve each other so that we can grow more and more like him because that's what he does and that's what he has done ever since the beginning. And so as we participate in that we learn and grow and become more and more according to his image. Verse 26, it says, As if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. And if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Brethren, notice that in just before it says, it, it talked about so that there would be no division in the body, but that we would have the same care for one another. So how do we eliminate divisions? How do we eliminate the strife that sometimes we see in, in the body of Christ? And the answer is right here. By having the same care for one another. And notice what verse 26 says. If someone suffers, the whole body suffers with them by suffering together and rejoicing together. In other words, by sharing our life with one another. The good things and the not so good things. I remember one time having to announce some not so good news. In fact, I had to announce that I have a very aggressive cancer. And I remember that one individual in the audience felt encouraged 
by the fact that I was not hesitant to say it, that I was not too proud to hold back that information from the congregation. I'm glad that he felt encouraged by that, and I hope that he is more open as well and not proud to share his life. But that's what we're called to do, brethren. We're called to share our burdens, to share our joys, to be one body together, so that in the weakness of one, the strength of the other can, can serve and make things better. We're called to share life and life in Christ. The end of the rivalries and division is the genuine unity that we have in Christ. Because He's the one that unifies us. Verses 27 and 28. Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, and then miracles and gifts of healings and helps and ministrations and various kinds of tongues. Now notice the important thing in here is that it is Jesus Christ that unifies the church because we are Christ's body. And there is only one body, one church, one Lord, one God. Christ is the one who gives unity to the church. To find unity, therefore, what we really need to do is to be at one with the Lord. Let, let me put it this way. As we are at one with the Lord, then we are also at one with one another, because there is only one Lord. If I am at one with the Lord, and you are at one with the Lord, aren't we at one with the same one? And that would be Jesus Christ? And because there is only one Christ, then we are also at one with each other. And that can only be in Christ, indeed. But that's how Jesus Christ unifies the church, by making us one with Him. Now here it tells us also that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit give us a variety of offices. There are a variety of gifts, as we have seen. There is also a variety of roles that we are called to um, perform in the church. Now that statement, appointed in the church first, and then second, and then third, may indeed indi indicate some sort of rank. But the point made in the context is that all the roles are important. Now some roles may have more leadership, some roles may have a little more responsibility, or a different type, perhaps is better said, of, of responsibility, but they are all important, and that's a clear point that is made in the context here. Verses 29 and 30, all are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak with tongues, do they? Not as the emphasis that the Apostle Paul is putting in this statement. All do not interpret, do they? So Paul is emphatically saying that this, this the, the, it actually is reiterating and strengthening the point that he's been making. He points to a reality that the Holy Spirit has not called everyone to fulfill the same role. Each one of us has a different role. And we all need to work together for the same purpose, to fulfill the work of Jesus Christ in our generation. Listen, if the Christians are not doing the work of God in our generation, who in the world would do that? Now I know that God can raise His ser servants out of stones, but I really hope that He would have an answer for us, from us, they would say, Lord, here I am, send me. Because that's what we're called to do. We all have a different role, but all together, as we work together, 
We fulfill the work of Jesus Christ in our generation and there is nothing in the whole universe, nothing in the whole world that is more important than that. And I hope that we understand the reason for that. It changes eternity for every person that we touch. Verse 31, but earnestly desire the greater gifts and I will show you a still more excellent way. The greater, the greater gifts, what, what does it mean? Well, I think that the greater gifts are defined by the needs of the rest of the body. What is the greatest need in a congregation may be different from the greatest need of a different congregation. But whatever the greatest need is, this is what we should desire. And if you look at it that way, brethren, we see the love of God at work in action. Basically, the reasoning with that would be there is a need in the church. Lord, please provide for that need. And if I am the one you want to use, here I am. I want to serve my brothers and sisters in Christ and provide for the need that they have. It is a giving of ourselves for the benefit of the others. It is an expression of a love of God toward each other, and it is an expression of a love of God that will enrich that church. God works actively in the life of every believer. And yes, yours included. Now Paul here says, and I show you a still more excellent way, and we're going to be seeing that next time. That is the way of love, as we keep pointing out. The right reason for using the gifts that we receive. So, brethren, we're all different parts in the body of Christ. But one thing is clear, we're all also his disciples, which means that we are all his students, we are learners. And we've been given the privilege of being part of his body so that we have the opportunity to participate in the expression of his love toward one another and toward the world. It is for our benefit and learning that God has given us that privilege. A learning that cannot help in, in, happen in isolation. We cannot learn to serve one another if we are isolating ourselves from each other. We can only learn to serve one another in the body of Christ, within the confines of the body of Christ, within the fellowship of the body of Christ, within the communion that God has given us in the body of Christ. So brethren, let each one of us fulfill the role that the Holy Spirit has given us to fulfill and do that faithfully. Let us express the love of God through the gifts of the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit has imparted us according to His own will. Whatever that gift may be, it is important. Let us not rob the body of Christ, the church, of what the Lord has given us to share. And we will see, we will see that the Lord will bless His work, His work that is done in and through us. May God bless you. You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy, that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves.
worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me. Let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul.
day, as we come to the setting of the sun, and our eyes behold the evening light, may we sing your praises, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy at all times to be praised, O Son of God, O giver of life. Your glory fills the whole world. 